Hello and welcome back to the Guns on Pegs podcast. My name is George Brown and I'm the editor at Guns on Pegs. And as per usual, I'm joined by the managing director of Guns on Pegs, Chris Horn. Chris, how's it going? It's very good. It's been a long week, George. I know. I know it's that only these... Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're supposed to be professional and act like when these go out, but this is going to go out in about ten ten days, two weeks time. Uh, and so we've just launched a new platform. A whole new business, actually. And my God, it's taken its toll. So I've poured myself a really stiff drink. <laughs> well, we'll get onto that in a bit. Um, I've, you know, I've just come back from the Isle of Muck. You have. I you managed to off... squeeze that in, in amongst all of this, you know, shenanigans we've had going on at, 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 uh, behind our desks. Yeah. Very good of you. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean, like you, I kind of needed the break. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was a hell of a trip. You obviously will know what it's like being there. But I mean, it's incredible. I'm not going to say too much about it on here because I'm going to write it up for the new business that we've launched. So uh, if there's no other reason to go and check it out, uh, that is a reason to go and uh, have a look. But Chris, why don't you just quickly tell everybody what has been going on and why you need a stiff drink? (laughs) So a lot of listeners will remember um, about six months ago, we launched something called the Game Card app. On, on iOS and Android. And essentially, it was sort of like a, a halfway house between a magazine and a social network for people to write on and, and anyone can contribute. And we were monitoring all these little bits and, and it's been really successful. And we kind of knew that if it was, we would branch it out. So we've done that. We've rebranded to something that's now called Scribehound. It's an open publishing platform for those who live a countryside lifestyle, essentially is exactly what it is. And it's an evolution of the of the game card app. And we've basically launched a whole new website, obviously have rebranded the app. We've given it this broader focus of country lifestyle rather than just shooting. And it is looking and feeling epic. I'm so excited about this. And the idea is that, the, and this is a sort of long-term idea, our vision behind this is what people read and write about our country lifestyle is shaped and defined by the people who live it. So not any one publication. This is a very much an, a platform and network for people who live in the countryside. And I'm really excited about where it's going. Well, not just people who live in the countryside, though, right? People who play in the countryside, people who work in the countryside. Like it, if you if if the countryside is a place that makes you feel alive and you know, where it's your happy place, then then the idea is it's for you. Absolutely. It's the, it's the lifestyle point that's important. It's the countryside lifestyle, the, the, the things in the countryside that you enjoy. So it's going to allow me the opportunity to just write about country pubs, which is basically all I ever wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, actually, that's a really good point. Like, you know, one of the sort of, sort of proving grounds, I guess, for the idea was in many ways this podcast. You know, we yeah. saw, we, you know, with all the listener correspondence that we get, um, we know that everybody out there has got this kind of story in them. They've got an opinion to share or, uh, uh, you know, a funny story to tell or something along those lines. So we wanted to create a platform where people could do that. And we suspected, and it's turned out to be true, that people are interested in more than just shooting. You know, there's always those shared passions, fishing and stalking and country pubs and, you know, whatever it might be, basket weaving or you know, I don't know. Um, <laughs> it could be anything. And it's really exciting. I'm really looking forward to seeing what people are going to put out there and, and who's going to build the audience. It's going to be good. So so if you want a profile on Scribehound, uh, go on there, have a look. Uh, there's a Become a Writer page. It will show you what you need to do. There's loads of developments coming in the future. Uh, and you want to sort of get on there now, really, and just sort of get going. Tell us, you know, tell everyone about what excites you. Yeah, so it's scribehound.com. Very easy. Right, Chris, um, enough about us. Who's joining us on the podcast today? So our guest today was chairman, no less, of the National Gamekeepers Organization for five years up until very recently. And that means that we can now get him on the the pod and understand everything he didn't want to say while he had that role. (laughs) (laughs) He has also written a book titled On Your Shoot, uh, which is a practical guide to running your own shoot. So incredibly knowledgeable. He is a gamekeeper and a shoot manager of Millichoke Park Estate Shoot in Shropshire. So a really warm welcome uh, from all of our listeners to Liam Bell. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, George. It's very good to have you with us, Liam. Yeah, great, great to be here and a good build-up, yeah, especially the plug for the best-selling book. <laughs> Still a few copies available, and there's no truth to the rumour that the, the unsigned ones are worth more. It's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, so Liam, now that now that you've packed it in with the the NGO, do you are you feeling de de more happy, or is it, are you feeling slightly sad about it? It was strange because it had taken up such a huge part of my life. Uh, it was it was a second job, but I was very careful that it didn't didn't interfere with the day job. And then I had you know two school age children and some others who were you know a lot older so I didn't want to sort of impinge on their time and I didn't want to take up too much family time and I had the day job to do and it was a huge juggling act um and I said I'd do five years and I did five years the temptation's always to stay longer um I didn't I thought five's enough so when I sort of I sort of let the national committee and all the lads and girls know I was leaving there was, there was a bit of a relief but then when the plugs pulled you are sort of a bit stuck in in no man's land and you've got this spare time where you're reaching for your second phone and think you should be checking the second email address and, oh my God, I haven't got any more meetings to do. And Zoom calls, you know, a bit of pieces. <laughs> so it was a bit odd. So I was de- demob happy uh, to start with, but I do sort of miss the battle at the same time, you know? It, it probably, uh, you've had an interesting five years with all the things that have gone on, but to end just before going into the bird food situation, yeah. probably saved you a bit of time, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's it's always been here, but it's been different strains and and different types. Yeah. And this H five N one is 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 pretty virulent. It's it's high pathogen. It does does kill stuff. So yeah, but, but I think there's always something going on. And every time there was a hill, you'd get over it and think, ah, oh, yeah, it's going to be nice and easy now that somebody else would crop up. You know, <laughs> yes, those the, the much vaunted sunlit uplands have not materialised. Not materialised. <laughs> they came ever so close. But every t- every time a cloud crossed over the <laughs> crossed over the sun, and we were back to battling. You know, oh, that that's shooting, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. But it was it was good fun. It was. It was. Right. So the way we like to kick everything off, Liam, is to uh, have a quick go round and ask, "What's that you're drinking?" Right. If you if you started with me, I'm I'm going to be a bit boring, and I'm I'm going to give it like a a double answer. So at the moment, because it's relatively early, and I've got to go back out to work and drive a mule and not crash into things, <laughs> I'm actually drinking a cup of tea, um, which isn't very interesting. But if I was relaxing and if it was dark and if I wasn't going out, I'd have a glass of single malt. I'm not a malt snob. I don't mind which one it is. Like George. <laughs> but, I, but I'm snobby enough to say just a single. I don't like the blends much. And if you're not drinking a lot of it, I think you can afford to have a decent one. You know. And your favourite? My favourite. I like Highland Park. Oh, yeah. I, I do. It's, a, it's sort of, it's, it's from... Uh, it's from the Orkneys, and it's a bit underrated, or, or it's not so popular as some of the others. Um, but it's definitely it, it's mellow and it's nice. And I'm not much for the the West Coast peaty ones, or I, I like mm. it. I like it, and it's and it, it's very easy drinking. So you have to keep an eye on the bottle, you know? especially, <laughs> especially 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 if you've got a friend around. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's, yeah. It's they don't make goes. the bottles big enough. They don't. They don't. <laughs> so it would be Highland Park. A uh, little bit of water, maybe some ice. That that would be me. I'm yeah. with you on that one. George George doesn't do water, but I do. I do do water every time. Do you? Yeah. Oh, I always thought you avoided it, but anyway. No, no, I'm very much a drop of water sort of person. Um, but you're in good company on the cup of tea because we had uh, Mr. Digweed on in the previous episode and he was drinking tea as well, wasn't he? Yeah. If, you, if, you're, if you're half as accurate at him because you drink tea, then that's fine. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I ever would be. Me on my best days, nowhere near George on his worst day. Except whenever you enter a clay shoot, like one of these charity clay shoots, you always see a, an NGO team come top, which always really frustrates me. Yeah, well, whenever I entered, I just picked my teammates wisely. <laughs> <laughs> and then they carried me, you know? Yeah, there's always going to be some accurate keepers knocking around, that's for sure. <laughs> George, what are you drinking? Oh, well, I've, I, I, as I've just come back from the Isle of Mark, where I was drinking a lot of whiskey, I'm not drinking whiskey today. I've just got a, a lager. Oh, supermarket? Well, yes, it's Estrella Galicia. I don't know if you've had yeah, that that's, yet. That's very, very supermarket. Yeah, but it's 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 not been available in the UK all that long, and it's very, very nice. <laughs> you can't say it with a Spanish accent like it's not just an Estrella, mate. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's different. That's Estrella Dam. It's a different beer. Oh, I'm not having that. Go. Yeah, well, it's, just a, it's from a different part of Spain. Estrella Dam is from Valencia. And this is from Galicia. Which supermarket is this, George? I'm not think. I'm not feeling Aldi here, or, or the, <laughs> I, the one-stop spa shop. I'm, I can't, I'm thinking, I can't wait- tell you whether it's available in Aldi or not, but this one, I'm pretty confident, is from Waitrose. Yeah, I, I was thinking Waitrose. I'm not even sure. 
I'm not even sure there's a Waitrose in Shropshire. <laughs> really? <laughs> I don't think there is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe get a hold of me if there is. I, I thought you'd be having you'd have been having a Stella or a Foster's or something. No, that's normally Chris's style. Actually, no. Hold on, that's not true. I have, maybe <laughs> have I had a Stella or a Foster's? If I haven't, then thank you, Liam. I will have one on the next episode. But George, you should have brought some beers back for Muck because they've got oh. a selection of beers from all over the islands. I know we had one that was actually from the mainland, from the Shield Brewery called no goose i think so nice oh, it's good yes 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 I so remember. nice and i actually thought as i was drinking it i must remember to buy some of this and then i was just in such of a such a hurry to go home i did think about sitting there in a shoot lodge like on the island mark looking over the scenery and the, and the water you, like the beer just tastes better because of the surroundings doesn't it and it's all about the occasion as well yeah everything tastes better when you're having fun yeah. <laughs> and when you've had a busy day definitely yeah yeah the, like like this one i've got here which is now tasting really good right so come on you've trailed it hard <laughs> what have you got i told george earlier that i was going rogue okay because actually when we had patrick galbraith on the other day he went quite rogue with his drink he'd sort of made a concoction uh, from whatever he found in the cupboard i saw some white rum earlier and i was like ah, oh, yes it's exactly what i need a really stiff pint of white rum with something else so basically what i've got is called a scorpion and I first had it when I was about 16 on a on a beach in the Caribbean. I went away with my parents on a family holiday and I saw this thing behind the bar and they were like, oh, we'll get you a drink. I probably just started drinking. Anyway, it's a banana milkshake and rum. Oh my so, God. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually really nice. And I've always, ever since then, I've always enjoyed it. And people always look at me really funny, like what on earth is that you're drinking? But if you make it really, really strong, you really can't taste the rum in it, and it just adds a nice kick to it. And you're holding it up to the camera there, and it does look like you've just got a pint of milk. But from yeah, it, the it, description, <laughs> it sounds utterly repellent. <laughs> <laughs> it's going down really well, I can tell you that much. And it, yeah, it's just what I needed. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, well, good luck with that. Um <laughs> be interesting to see the interview panel you know the, the this podcast <laughs> pans yeah. out you know 45 minutes in chris is going to be slow uh, his words and yeah. slumped over his milkshake yeah. yeah i was gonna say if, if you if you hear a thump it's uh, chris <laughs> passing out george whose bird is it anyway yes so liam this is our first sort of listener correspondence section and it's where we ask our uh, our audience to send in their shooting dilemmas and quandaries and queries and that sort of thing yeah we always keep our correspondence anonymous mm-hmm. and i've decided to call this person roscoe for no particular reason at all and he's written dear george and chris i've recently acquired a new to me cocker spaniel A friend's brother-in-law didn't have time for him and he needed a new home, so I decided to bring him into mine. He's a year old, a lovely chocolate and tan coat, and like most cockers, he can be likened to a crackhead looking for a fix. Now for my my dilemma. He's called Dexter, which is shortened to Dex. However, I'm not a huge fan of this name, and given his fairly young age, the fact that he's only been trained to do the basics and doesn't respond very well to his name anyway... What is your opinion on changing his name? I'm planning on training him to pick up, so his name will be a fairly key part to it all. And he's added, P.S., here's some name suggestions. Boss, Hugo, Moose, or Blaza? (laughs) We're getting to name a dog on the pod. Yeah, because we've named a racehorse, haven't we? (laughs) We should have saved this right to the end when (laughs) this this banana milkshake's gone. (laughs) Uh. Go on then. Names in the hat. Names yeah. in the hat. Yeah. I wasn't particular. I mean, I don't want to upset Roscoe, but I wasn't particularly um, enamoured with any of them, really. Yeah. I- Bit too generic. I'm a fan of sort of male names for dogs. Yeah, I, yeah I- like Dave. Yeah, Dave, Alan, Jeff. <laughs> Alan is a great name for yeah. a dog. Cause, yeah, because then you can do like that uh, yeah. that thing. Ow, ow, Alan. Yeah, boy. Yeah, <laughs> I've got one in my kennel called Boris, <laughs> who misbehaves and has got mad hair. Yeah, <laughs> but I've still got him, and he's still there. He's still. Is it know. is is it yellow? No, it's sadly not. It's it's black. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's 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 black. And I've got an Idris, named named after not a uh, named after Idris the Dragon. From um, from Ivor the Engine. Oh yes, Does anyone remember? Yes. I do. Yeah, George, where are you going with names? Well, I was just going to say on on changing the dog's name. I'm not enough of a dog training expert, 
but my suspicion is that dogs don't really understand name so much as tone and I guess the sh- the shape of the sound and that sort of thing. So I'm not sure that they necessarily know that their name is Dexter or whatever. So I think it's probably okay <laughs> to change the name. And it's often the case that they have like a kennel club name that's ridiculous and then you choose a different one. We had a dog that's kennel club's name was Tractor Trailer. Like we're obviously not going to stand in the field and shout that, are you? Um, and like you know, obviously registered by the breeder or whatever. Um, so I think you can definitely go with a change. I, I have to say I'm a, I'm in agreement that I love like a sort of really prosaic, just normal human name. Um, yeah. The yeah. danger with that is that you're then in the shooting field with somebody who's got that name. Yes, <laughs> and you're sw- you're swearing and shouting. Exactly, Alan, Alan come here, you. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Where are you got, sniffing? What are you up to? And it's yeah. your and it's your mate's guest who you've not really ever met. <laughs> and I think I mentioned it on the last podcast that a friend's uh, a friend of my dad had a dog called Oi, which I think is particularly good if you've got a an unruly cocker spaniel. I like that. Um, I actually quite like Moose though. I think Moose is a good name for a dog. Mm. I I don't think it's going to make any difference. I think he could choose whatever. If if it was the brother-in-law's dog and the brother-in-law hasn't had time for it, I'm going to just hazard a guess. It doesn't take any notice of its name anyway. <laughs> you know, yeah. it could be it could be one of those. So maybe a maybe a pip on the whistle and the new name. It'll forget its old name. I think it will. You know. Yeah, I think I, I think so. If it's young, I think this is you know, now. It's your chance, isn't it? Have, I, I think he's also got to consider if he's going to have another dog ever, because I like it when people have dog names which start to sort of match or in the same group. Like, I tell you who does this well. Barney Stratton, who's been on the pod before, has got like pebble, stone, gravel. And you hear him shouting on the peg. It's quite funny. Um, ha- how about like Difa? Difa dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's very good. <laughs> my brother got a black lab many years ago and he was thinking about naming it roots a maneuver as in roots maneuver who's a uk rapper and then he was going to have the next one was going to be heimlich and then the third <laughs> one was going to be mirror signal <laughs> <laughs> and out yeah <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I think like there's there are definitely like gun dog naming conventions, aren't there? There's lots of I think there's I think it's mainly spaniels going around as teal or something like yeah. that. There's lots of that kind of thing going on. You could name it after your favourite shoot. Far too many purdies out there as well. I agree. I agree. And on, two, I, on the teal thing, it's nothing more annoying if you're rough shooting. Did know a man with a spaniel <laughs> called called Snipe who spent his whole oh, time sh- shouting it. And oh, no, I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd steer away from uh, bird names if if you can. Yeah, that would be so frustrating on a walked up day, wouldn't it? Snipe, what, 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 where? All the time, <laughs> and he was he was a beater. And we, I was working in Mid Wales, and we were pushing a pushing a bog off to some guns hidden beside the you know, the other side of a hedge. Nothing more. For, I was, I was, after after the first drive, the head keeper went up to him because I was just be said try and use the whistle, but the whistle was no better. <laughs> it was no. So we had a constant whistle. It was more. It was like a Mardi Gras fest. He was just blowing his whistle the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't come back. Chris, yeah. have you got any? Have you got any name suggestions? I, I don't know. I'm not very good at this. Yeah, I definitely really like the human thing. Also, like, there's also something quite funny about it because you know how, like, the dog is always, like, your companion when you're out shooting and you, you have all these fond memories. I just think having a human name for it is quite fun. Yeah. So, pick, um, pick, pick someone that means something. Give it, actually, call it, what was his brother in law's name? Just well, call no, it I, that. Even better, go with Roscoe. Yeah. Which is his, maybe. his, his alter, alter ego. It, you've chucked it in the hat. We need to find out. Yes, yeah. definitely. Let us know what you decide. Yeah, was Hugo one of his names? What were his four names? Yes. Yeah, he, he he suggested Boss Hugo Moose and Blaza. Well, Hugo, Hugo, it's one of his names. It's a boy name. There you Actually, go. Hugo works. Yeah, Hugo works. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, my um, my parents when they first got uh, miniature Dachshund, I was like, you've got to give it the most Germanic like name that you can think <laughs> of. <laughs> And what he is Percy, called? which well, he's Percy, which is short for Percival, <laughs> which is nearly there. But I was definitely pushing for like Wilhelm or something like that. <laughs> Hans, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think people need to take this part more seriously with the dog naming, don't they? It's it's, it's an opportunity. Well, I think it's an opportunity. Look, you can't give your child a stupid name, but you can give your dog a stupid name. 
Definitely. <laughs> some yeah. some do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got any children with stupid names, Liam? Uh, no. <laughs> George called one of his children Otis because he wanted it. To, he wanted Otis to sound like an, uh, a, a Caribbean cricketer. Yeah, Otis Brown. Yeah, and so I think yes. it's a, he's definitely a West Indian fast bowler from the seventies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 and a good one, or maybe like an R and B singer. I prefer the fast bowler. Yeah, yeah, same. I prefer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe reggae. Yeah, yeah, maybe reggae eighties. Thank you, Roscoe, or whatever your name is, for sending that in. Enjoyed that. Yeah, it was good. Right, Chris. Unpopular opinions. What have we got? Uh, so this one comes from someone uh, that we shall call Zebedee, who writes: uh, Back at the beginning of August, you had an Instagram post of a trusty black Labrador. And yes, a Labrador will usually be faithful, trustworthy and steady. But oh, how boring and dull, he says. However, a Springer arguably requires better handling, remains slightly unpredictable, often outperforms their owner despite their calls and is basically much more exciting and rewarding and fun. You've got someone in the Springer camp. Did this person finish their letter with discuss? (laughs) <laughs> i think that was implied <laughs> he's, he's left it very open i've read it out as a labrador owner so i shall go straight to you liam because i reckon you've got a few different breeds what have you got at the moment i have got i've got labradors cocker spaniels okay and the new addition who is germanic her name is margot yeah which ah. which get um ah, but i didn't i didn't go to germanic now and, and she's a bavarian mountain hound okay Ooh. Now, are they the enormous ones? No, they're the smaller ones. So, And she's a bit small for her type. So they'll grow up to 20, 22 inches. They, okay. And when she, was, when she was small, she looked for all the world like, a, like sort of a dachshund. And I thought right. she was going to get a complex because whenever anyone stopped by to talk to her and she's in the truck or the mule or out, like, oh, dachshund, why have you got a dachshund? And I had to keep correcting them. And in the end, I felt I should be sort of putting something over her ears so she didn't hear it because I didn't want, to get her, <laughs> didn't want to get in a complex. But she's very, very different. I've had, I've had gun dogs before and a few lurchers and a whippet, and, but houndy and just behaves totally different. You know? Interesting. Well, most importantly, you're very well placed to then, to then debate on this opinion. Uh, that someone is putting their, some, themselves firmly in the camp. That He's pro Springer. Yeah, so not just any type, but a Springer specifically is absolutely the one to have. Go on then, Liam. Yeah, I, I think he's done this tongue in cheek. I think he's just done it to stir. So I don't believe any, I don't think anyone believes that. I think, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's not just an unpopular opinion. It's just no one has this yeah, opinion. <laughs> no one has it. I think this person felt sorry for Springer Spaniels, thought they were underrepresented on the podcasts and thought they'd just throw, th- roll that hand grenade in. I've had good springers, good cockers, good Labradors, wild Labradors, dreadful Labradors, amazing springers. I don't think it's in the breed. I think it's in the strain. It's more down to the handler. And I suggest if this person has got amazing springers, he could, he or she could probably have amazing Labradors as well. There we go. That's a bit Very fence city, isn't it? But it's, uh, no, it's, so you're actually this this outspoken person. You're suggesting he actually might be quite a good dog handler. Yeah, quite a good dog handler, and he could probably get the best out of a Labrador as well. Whereas some people, regardless of what they owned and what they were given and what they paid for, it would always, you know, be a, a wild, unruly brute that wrecked things, ruined days, and upset people, wouldn't it? You know, <laughs> ten grand dog ruined in a fortnight. Yeah, people do that. <laughs> Do, do dogs usually turn out like their owners? Do we think that like children? Uh, um, oh God, I hope not. Thinking about my kids, that is not my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, they can do. People do. If if someone has a dog that bites, they very often have a succession of dogs that bite. It's the, it's. I think it's the dog picks up on stuff, you know, aggression and stuff from from the owner. I think from the owner, yeah. Or they pick up on the the owner's nervousness, sort of going down the lead and they pick up on it and feel they should do something about it you know yeah and that's very interesting but generally people who have nice calm biddable dogs always have nice calm biddable dogs you know i don't there's a lot of there's a lot of um there's a lot of training goes on that you don't know you're training them just ask them to be quiet and sit and calm and waiting you know chris where are you <laughs> putting cora on the uh the nice calm biddable scale so she's not calm she's quite nice she, oh she she's calm in a sense that she's just very scared of everything 
uh, any form of stick. I don't. I mean, she hasn't been out yet. I'm, it's going to be quite nerve wracking. What's going to happen here? I don't know about boring and dull as he describes Labradors here. I think that's a bit unfair. Yeah, depends what else you've got going on in your life as well. If you've got young children, I quite like a boring and dull dog. I, I don't think I, it is a stereotype, isn't it? So there must be some truth in that that the the Labrador is kind of a bit like Jeeves, you know, sort of polished and presents the bird on a nice silver platter, and the Springer goes tearing around like a lunatic there's got there is i mean I, I think there is something in that but i'm inclined to agree with our correspondent here i am much more of a spaniel person than a labrador person and given the choice over a cocker and uh, a springer i would have a springer oh really um, i thought about it and if i did go spaniel i'd go for a cocker but that's interesting i read somewhere that back in the early days of spaniels there wasn't really a breed distinction between cockers and springers that basically the tall ones were called springers and the small ones were called cockers and you know you could have a cocker and a springer from the same litter really mm. there's a bit of that going on now i know they don't own up to it <laughs> <laughs> so unpopular but not completely out there is in like no one had that opinion like we might think because you've joined him george yeah i'm definitely i'm I'm on his side anyway the the uh for anyone that did want to know the labrador is the most popular gun dog so it is unpopular (laughs) (laughs) yes statistically wrong so we've got a shooting hero that's been sent in by someone whose actual name is callum he writes dear george and chris i would like to nominate my shooting hero as my late uncle jimmy templeton As the youngest member of our large extended family, I was the only one to have expressed an interest in shooting, and this brought joy to my uncle Jimmy, who was the inspiration for me getting into it. From the age of five, every fortnight from November to January, Uncle Jimmy would arrive in the early hours to take me along to his syndicate, where I would attempt to flag birds towards him. This continued for many years until he let me stand at one of his pegs and take his gun, a 24 silver pigeon. I stood there in great excitement, waiting for an opportunity to raise the gun, but more times than not, nothing appeared. It wasn't until I was older that I realised that he would always let me stand on a drive, knowing there would be very little in the wood. I remember approaching one upcoming season, realising this would be his first year as a gun who did not have a gun dog, as his spaniel Toby was now retired. I spent that summer training one of my other aunt's dogs up the best I could. As we arrived at the first drive of the season, my uncle took her off me and said, let's see how well you trained her and walked off into the wood. Thankfully, there wasn't too much screaming and shouting and no dog ended up at the flushing point early. So I took that as a success. Uncle Jimmy was a man of very few words, praised the work I'd put into the dog. This was truly one of my proudest moments. We then had a good few seasons, all three of us, with me getting more and more opportunity to stand on the busier drives with my uncle Jimmy by my side. Sadly, he died several years ago. Since then, Ellie, the dog I had trained, has had a litter of pups and my wife and I took one of her pups, our first dog, Millie, who I have since trained up using the experience gained from Ellie and any tips passed on to me from Uncle Jimmy. I've since then joined my own syndicate and treat myself to a driven day at a well-established shoot once a year. I still use the 20 ball silver pigeon left to me by Uncle Jimmy. Only now, in reflecting back, do I appreciate all the effort and time invested by Uncle Jimmy over the years and the foundations that he gave me. I feel very fortunate to have come from the grassroots as a five-year-old flagger to being able to stand on driven days, and I'll be forever grateful to him and will do my best to pass this inspiration on to my two young daughters. Lovely. It is lovely. really nice. Yeah, yeah, a proper hero. Yeah. It doesn't it just bring back all sorts of memories? That did for me reading that. Just just memories of like when you sort of first getting into shooting and who the people were around you that almost like guided your path and, and almost taught you how to act and, and things like that. that. That's what I was remembering. It's interesting. Yeah. It's a running theme with these shooting heroes, isn't it? That it's very often the people who kind of mentored you into it yeah. are the people who you think of as your shooting hero, which is really nice. It just shows, I think, how much those people have an impact on your life. Yeah. Yeah. Really nice. Liam, are your kids into shooting? Um, they they've all shot so so far. My eldest had a shot at a few clays. She's not really into shooting, but she is good at shooting possums with her with her twenty two and catching them with her terrier <laughs> <laughs> in New Zealand. So she she loves that. My second daughter, my middle daughter, she wasn't so keen. Had a go, wasn't her. That's fine. Uh, eldest son 
Yeah, there's a, there's a few of them. There's a list. Yeah. <laughs> All you've done is just you've managed to have a beating line. That's what that was. Yeah, the movie, wasn't yeah. It? Or, a, or a five-a-side <laughs> football team. Isn't it? Um, my my eldest son is a very good shot, very keen, and he he worked with me as a keeper, and he got a couple of other keeping jobs, and he's now in in hunt service. He's a cattle huntsman with a pack of hounds. Oh, cool. So wow. he, he he joins that. So country sports, but when he gets days off. When, when, which isn't often, and he's, he gets a few nice invites, and he still likes the shooting and things. And he, he was a very good, was a good shot. He still is a good shot, not as good as his dad, obviously. But he's quite, a, <laughs> he's, he's quite, he's quite a good shot. And then my youngest daughter, who's keen on beating and likes coming out, she's had a few shot on shots on the Cox days. Uh, I think, and I think, I think there's a theme because if, if, if the school ever looked at the registers. You know, if they ever tracked it back, they'd find us. My kids are always ill on the last couple of days of January. First of February. First of Feb, they're 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 always ill. And when when Michael was um was was up was sort of thirteen, fourteen, or something like this, we had a midweek day. A few of his mates want to come because they want they want pocket money. You know, they want pocket money. They like it. So I, the two of his two of his friends came, and I had a phone call and forgetting about this and. And I was, I had so many other things to juggle about. And you're supposed to phone the school to say they're ill or, you know, make up they've got a stomach bug or a headache or, or some of this. And I got a phone call from his head of house and the phone, and we were just lining out, just going to this maize crop. And it was about five past 10 and the drive had just started. And I, so I pick it up and it said the school. So I picked it up. I said, I said, hello. Oh, hello, Mr. Bell. It's, it's, you know, so and so and so from the school. I said, oh, hello. How are you? He says, fine. That's right. I'm Michael. He said, we've, he said, Michael's absent from school and you, you haven't emailed or, or rung him in to say he's ill. And I said, ah, well, um, I said, he, he, he's, look, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I said, he's out shooting. He's out shooting me. And at that moment, one of his mates sort of was just moving a bit too fast. And I shouted, although I moved my phone. I shouted, Ashley, Ashley, stay there. Hold back. Over. And I put my phone back to him. And he said, if you could just let Ashley to sort of get his parents to phone us as well. He said, have you got anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> I said, ah, um, yeah, it's his confession time. He said, and he was very good. And he said, look, he said, he said, I know they're not sort of uh, vandalizing things or burning telephone boxes or making a mess in town or, or, or breaking the, and doing anything. He said, but if you just make sure their parents phone them in, which I did uh, when the drive had finished. I said, sorry, lads, but I may have just got you into a bit of trouble. I mean, their parents knew they were there, but their parents had forgot to phone them in as well. Didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> my youngest daughter's turning into a nice shot and she does army cadets and she's a good rifle shot as well. And then my youngest, he's just started with the 410. He was on the air rifle, the 410, and he's quite the squirrel shot. He hasn't had a shot at anything moving or any pheasants yet. He's not quite old enough. I, I don't I think you should. I think if you start them too early, give them too much too young. The, 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 they lose that passion and that, that hunger for it. You know? Yeah, probably something in that. Yeah. yeah. Really- and in the answer rabbits, because we didn't, the others sort of learnt on rabbits with a 2 2, but now the viral hemorrhage disease got rid of the rabbits. We're on the squirrels, of which there are many hundreds, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So they, they all like it. They all like it. Yeah. As does, as does my wife. <laughs> How many was that? Children or squirrels? <laughs> <laughs> they sound like a similar number. <laughs> <laughs> um, five, yes. Okay, five. Okay. Five. five. I think Good. five's enough, you know? Yeah. It, well, I, I, I'm glad you, I don't know. I think a lot less than five's enough. But. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had this, this chat last October when we were out shooting, didn't we? <laughs> we did, yeah. <laughs> I'm, and I'm now learning 10 months into the job what it's like. So, yeah, I, I, I won't be getting anywhere near five, Liam. <laughs> <laughs> I said that, but hey, you know. <laughs> very good very good yeah i think that's a very nice shooting hero submission so callum you along with roscoe and zebedee and now of course you liam as well are the latest members of the most noble order of the garters and will soon be in receipt of your very own set of the very exclusive guns on pegs podcast shooting sock garters if you too have got a shooting confession a quandary or a query that you'd like us and our guests to help you with or if you've got an unpopular opinion or you just like a set of garters uh, and you want to chance your arm, drop us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com. And if we use your submission in any episode in the future, we will get you some garters. So just on that point, I had a, I had a text from George Digweed the other day. And he's like, thanks for the garters. I've worn them today. And everyone called me a f- <laughs> <laughs> So for those that haven't seen the the famous podcast garters, they, they're they a sort of pink and purple and all sorts. We basically went for the most garish things we could find. And George is obviously wearing them with pride 
uh, I hope he sticks at it and just ignores the abuse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so a lot of people are very proud of them. Yeah. I'll, I'll wear them. I'll, I'll save them for high days and holidays and, and away oh, days. very good. Yeah, yeah. correct. Definitely. I did have a fancy pair of guns on pegs, sort of plastic shooting sunglasses type things. Oh, you did? I keep spotting them on Instagram. People just appear and they're wearing our sunglasses. Mine only lasted about a week. Oh, really? I'll stick yeah. some in the post here. Thank you. There we go. That's it. That's all I want. I only want a free pair of sunglasses. <laughs> I find you need a pair for the glove box of every vehicle that you get into. Yes. So you'll probably have like, a, you know, a, a few different mules and all sorts. You just need yeah. them everywhere. We need them everywhere. Yes. And we can advertise guns on pegs. Yes. Okay. Deal. So uh, just a quick reminder, our 50th episode, which is the end of the series, is live. Uh, we're going to do it from Clay's Bar which is a bar in London. It's, it's at Mortgage uh, near Liverpool Street in the city on the Friday, the 4th of November. So we need lots of listener correspondence for this one because it, it won't be sort of a guest type episode. It's going to be lots of listener correspondence with lots of audience interaction, people's opinions. Any time from 5 p.m., if, if you can get yourself to London, come along, uh, join in, there's drinks. And Clay's Bar is a, a sort of shooting simulator bar. So all the simulators are going to be open and there'll be all sorts of fun competition go on. And no need to RSVP. Anyone can turn up. Bring, you know, if you're a listener, bring along a couple of shooting mates. We're going to look forward to seeing everyone there. Yeah. And I think we're going to start recording about 7.30. I think that's yeah. about, something like that. Who knows? Well, yeah. <laughs> but so we're, we're going to give people time to get in, you know, after work. You know, people who are outside London maybe want to come in. Definitely. Give them a chance to get up before we hit the record button. We've already had confirmation of people flying down for this. Well, we? I don't know if it's confirmed, but I've definitely heard of one or two people who are looking into flights from Aberdeen. So Goodness. serious dedication to the cause there. Yeah. Well, we'll be there nice and early with a few drinks. So we'll try not to be too far gone by the time we click record. But hey, ho. <laughs> if you are, who'll care? You know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Friday the 4th of November, so look forward to it. How's the scorpion going down, Chris? I think we need an update. It's having the desired effect. I can tell. <laughs> God. <laughs> I t- honestly, I really needed this. We were having various different boring website developer-related issues earlier, and uh, this is exactly the way to finish it off. <laughs> <laughs> right. Liam, I've got a very important question to ask you, and it's okay. one that's been bugging me since I was about six years old. Right. It's very important. I'm sure it's one that lots of other people have been asking themselves for a long time as well. And the question is this. What the fuck is going on with beating noises? What, <laughs> what, where's that all come from? Why do we make those weird noises? What is happening? <laughs> I abhor beating noises. <laughs> I, they are dreadful. They are dreadful. Maybe if you're abroad, just moving boar, or somewhere in the Far East and it's dangerous game, but for pheasants or partridge, no, not needed at all. It sounds terrible. It, no one knows what's going on because of all these noises. And people seem to think that if they shout enough and make enough noises, they don't actually have to do any beating. They can just wander about, <laughs> wander about catcalling, making noises, but not actually beat anything or move it. It's almost as my other bugbear while I'm on it is people who clap their hands. You get, you get beaters who are clapping and it's infectious. So someone starts clapping when you've asked them to tap the stick. The whole bloody line start clapping. You know? And they're all just clapping. And no one's doing anything and no one's beating anything. And there's nothing worse than the human voice to make to make game go flat. And really? Stop them running on. Yeah. If you're tapping a, I- tapping a stick, they know you're there. They see you. They'll just keep creeping on. People start shouting and talking. They go, they go flat. And they won't get to where you want them. They'll fly in all different directions. And no one can hear what the keepers are saying. I think this could be the most important podcast issue we've ever discussed. Yeah. <laughs> <Which> is, <laughs> hon- honestly, I, I, the first time I ever went beating, you know, you're so nervous. You stand there and the bloke next to you starts going, and you're like, what the, what earth is he doing? Yeah. And then you feel the need to copy and you we make these strange noises. And at no point did anyone go, right, here are the noises for a shoot day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or here, or here are no noises. We were we were fra- we were told off when we were I was young. So any noises other than a tapping of a stick pre radios, any noise other than the tapping of a stick, you couldn't hear what was going on. So the headkeeper said, "Stop! Mm. How can you know if someone shouted stop if everyone brr brr in high high in and you you in it? They, they can't they can't hear it. Yeah? <laughs> and it sounds dreadful. You're stood there on the back. You don't know if someone's shouting cock forward, bird back. And what about the guys? Here we go. What about the guys who shouted a bird after it's flown back? 
You do get those. <laughs> yes. So as it as it goes back, they shout and make a noise. But it's already gone past them. Why do they? Why do they bother? <laughs> Is it because they're worried they're not putting enough effort in? I don't know. Right. So where on earth did these stupid noises come from? I think they're contagious. They're like the clapping. Someone, someone. We need to do something. The need to do something. I need to do. So- I'm tapping my stick. I think I should do something. Someone else shouted. So let's shout as well. You know? But there are a few noises that are just yeah. like the go-to noises. Yeah, yeah. Next week, this is a bit of an announcement as well. There's a reason I asked this question a little bit. So uh, next week, Digby and I will be recording the first ever official Shoot Hub podcast, which is aimed more at the sort of shoot management keeper type community. Mm. And I was racking my brains for fun listener correspondence that we could do. <laughs> and I, it's partly a study as well, because I believe that there's going to be regional differences in shooting noises and i want to build a library of um of, <laughs> of, of of beating noises so what i want people to do is i want them to send us a, a voice memo on on instagram of their preferred beating noise and we will then have a beating noise of the day for each episode and we'll work out something similar to the garters for people who send them in you know, you know if you don't tell emma in the office that this is what you've asked for <laughs> when, when she goes into the instagram inbox <laughs> she's gonna be like, what on earth is going on <laughs> i think they're unnecessary i don't want to sound like some old old curmudgeonly sort of guy but i don't think you need all the shouting and the high in and the oh it sounds it sounds unpro- i'm sure it's fun but i, I think it's um it sounds sort of unprofessional, you know. It, there's uh, definitely reg- there's going to be regional differences because I remember when when Frank, who works with us, uh, he was like he started talking about brushing, and we were like, "What on earth, brushing?" Mm. And brushing in East Anglia is beating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of people who would never have heard of that as a term. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's going to be all sorts of different things. Yeah, in, um, in Shropshire, a brushing hook is a bill hook. So if someone right. sends if someone sends you off as my head keeper did, not to me, but someone who'd worked for him. He sent him off. He said, I, and this lad wasn't from Shropshire. He said, go up to cock cover and brush the right. And he looked at him <laughs> and he looked back. He said, he said, pardon? He said, go and brush the right. And he really, so he did with a brush, with a broom. <laughs> I'd better do what he said. This guy's fierce. I'd do what he said. And then he came back with a broom, the kennel broom over his shoulder and he'd brush the right, every little bit of it. He didn't know why, but he didn't dare question a third time. <laughs> you don't do. Yeah, so there are br- there is a brushing. They are brushing hooks, whereas other people have bill hooks and brummocks mm. and all sorts of other things. Yeah. Well, I hope that question alone has sparked debate amongst syndicates in the coming weeks as to say, what on earth are we doing making all these noises? And if what you say is true, Liam, which I'm sure it is, yeah. that it actually has an impact on the birds, then everyone needs to stop right away. It makes the driving of them worse. Can I just add one thing to the mix, though? Because you then said uh, tapping, obviously with a stick. Yeah. With the old electronic ear defenders, and I'm going to sound like a right snob here, but standing on the peg with the electronic ear defenders, if there's loads of tapping in the background, oh, my God, it can get... If you're standing in a wood, sometimes the noise gets overwhelming and you end up having to, like, turn them off, literally. Uh, that's the only problem with tapping versus noises. But yeah, anyway. first, first world problem that is. That's a first world. Problem. <laughs> Just turn them off. Turn Him them off. Fancy Bluetooth yeah, exactly. ear defenders. Yeah, they've probably got guns on pegs across the top, haven't they? You know, they? No, they haven't. No. They're given <laughs> given to me by someone else. <laughs> but I mean, actually, as a gun, like actually being able to hear the beaters can be quite helpful. Uh, definitely. Yeah, heads up, don't you? Yeah, you can sort of hear them approaching. You know when you need to leg it from your neighbour's peg to yours because you've been having a chat. Yeah, and if and if you're on a smaller shoot where the cloud isn't full of birds, and there are eight or ten guns, and you're only shooting fifty or sixty, and you have a quiet beating line, when someone shouts forward, which is allowed, but you don't yeah. all need to shout it. But if, <laughs> but if one one of the ten beaters or twelve beaters shouts forward, you do lift your head up and have a look. But if it's yeah, just yeah. this const, constant background noise and shouts, everyone gives up. You know. No one's looking, yeah. and, the, and the few birds are in. They go the other way. I do want to know where I I I came from, then. Yeah, all the yeah, br- 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 yeah the telephone noises. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Yeah, well, so it? we're going to categorise these these sounds that people send in, and then we'll do a a library of noises, and we'll do a map based on the regional differences. And uh, yeah, I think it's going to be fun. It sounds like a, like a year's worth of work. <laughs> yeah, and then once it's all done, we'll delete it all because it's all pointless. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> I think as well, I'm going to get one or two of my beaters who are occasionally guilty of being over enthusiastic and making noises to tune into the podcast. I was like, just, just, t- just have a listen to that podcast. Just, just see, because I'm too polite on p- shoot days to ask them to shut up. This is almost a segment, you know, bosses that need to say something to their team without actually saying it yeah. to their face. <laughs> yeah. This passive aggressive type, just listen to the podcast. That's all I, just listen to the podcast. Whereas on shoot days, could you just keep the noise down, please? Okay, okay, yeah. we're all just quiet for a minute. And well, I've just given them now. They can, if they don't listen, if they listen to this and they don't take the hint, they're off. They're gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. Good, good. Well, I think um, you might have opened just, we might get some correspondence about that, I think. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. Uh, My next question, on a shoot day, I think I might already know the answer to this based on the last five minutes of conversation. (laughs) Who's hardest to control? The beaters, the dogs, or the guns? Um, I think that I'm in control of the beaters, so I feel happy. The dogs are only allowed out if they're under control. But our guns, I have to say, our guns are very well behaved as well. I've got a, I've got a strong boss and a strong, and his son's equally strong. And people behave and they follow, and any messing about, that's it. You know, sounds like a very abnormal shoot. <laughs> yeah, it's a, very, it's, a, it's a very apart from the Labrador called Boris we mentioned earlier. With it, with, yeah. apart from him, but that's sort of allowed as like a keeper's dog thing. So all dogs have to behave apart from gamekeeper's Labrador, which is wild. It's not calm and placid like that guy with the Springer who, like whatever his name was, Roscoe, who, who, who wrote that letter. It's not like his Labradors. This is a wild one, you know? Good wild. It'd be advertised in the page of the Shooting Times as good rough shooting dog. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say look, they're, they're equal. They are, I think. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, so you, so you've obviously been in the game. Well, how long have you been keeping shoot management, all that sort of stuff? Since the age of fifteen. So, the change over that period, would you say it's been quite large, or are we actually still doing much of what we did back in the day? I, I think the basics are so. I think it's easier. Gamekeepers are going to live longer and have less. Com- you know, we've got mules, we've got quads, <laughs> we're hopper feeding. We've got waterproofs. We've got things that keep us warm. We've got proper boots. We're well looked after. It's it's not. Whereas the old gamekeepers were all buggered by the time they were sixty with rickets and bad backs and sore knees and popping hips and all the rest of it. So I think we'll last longer. Are we doing much the same? Yes. Although we're expected to look after a, a, a greater number of birds. So the the Rupert Bruder, which was a little paraffin affair that later changed to gas was marketed that one man could now look after a thousand birds. He could have 10 of these little contraptions and rear a hundred under each and have a thousand for one man. That was their selling point. Now there are part-time guys doing three and four times that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it has changed. A lot of it's changed, a lot of it for the good. I think the health and safety stuff, while it's boring, is is very important. Yeah. And and it's made a lot of difference. Uh, And we should be doing that. I think we're more accountable. I think there's um, there's a lot of good. It's more inclusive. Shooting's definitely more inclusive. 40, yeah. 40 years ago, to shoot for a pheasant, you had to be very rich, very well connected, or doing it illegally. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. Where now, I mean, maybe this year has thrown a bit of a curveball in, but if we go five years ago, if you had a full-time job and you know one or two friends – or a bit of money, you could buy a day somewhere and shoot a few pheasants. So I think I think it's coming, and I'd be a shame if it got so expensive that it, it it went back to how it had been. I agree entirely. That's yeah. that's the that's the that's what's worried me most about this year. Actually, it just it starts to become something that pushes a few people out. Mm. That, that mm. yeah, I hope that doesn't happen. I, th- I think it probably will, but I, th- I think it might be sort of temporary. If the choice is paying the mortgage and a family holiday, or your syndicate subs. Hmm. you know yeah. yeah i mean it's it's top of the sort of luxury uh, yeah. expenditure pile isn't it yeah it is you're going to do mortgage family holiday bills first aren't you you know yes i mean yeah. priority is all wrong but that's what people will do that's what, they'll, <laughs> that's what they'll do they'll feel pushed into it by their wives won't they? that was one of the upsides <laughs> of a little bit the little bit of covid is that you didn't have to do the family holiday and shooting was still okay for large parts of it yeah yeah oh, well and the same we've got a few I tell you, we've seen more of we've got more lady guns now so it's wrong of me to say pushed into by their wives pushed into by their husbands we've more laid a lady gun 
was 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 rare yeah and and remarked upon even 25 years ago there were very few ladies and now now a lady gun no one bats an eyelid you know yeah true. yeah because there are fewer the lady guns who shoot are keener and they they go for it more they practice more they try harder so i rarely see a lady gun who can't shoot because i think she knows it, it's going to be tough going in there so that so they 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 sort of got a, a fairly high side. Where, whereas blokes, if they can't shoot, they're a bit. Oh, I can't shoot, which it seems again you you can always make yourself better, you know. So I think there are more ladies, <laughs> more youngsters. So it has changed. I think we've lost a bit a bit of respect for the bird. I think that as well. You know, yeah. you know they they were revered at one time. A pheasant was revered. It was a prize, and I, and I think it, it's cyclical. But I th- I think now. People see them, sadly, some some see them as a commodity, you know, part of their day, but they don't sort of, you know, it's a, a pheasant, especially such brilliant colours and it's so good to eat and it was such a prize, you know. So things things have changed, yeah. A lot for the better, but maybe one or two for the worse. So, so, so where, where do you reckon it's going then? Now, how about from here, 5, 10, 20 years what do you think the biggest differences we're going to see? The biggest differences we're going to see, I think there will be some form of legislation. I don't know if it'll work, but we need to be able to show a net biodiversity gain. You know, yeah. we need to be able to show that. I think there'll be restrictions on uh, maybe rearing practices and things. I think in the next five years with bird flu being so so prevalent at the moment, game farming is fairly unregulated yeah which isn't necessarily a good thing none of the people who are doing it properly are are scared of legislation in fact they most of the ones i've spoken to think it would be a good idea because they're doing it properly and playing by the rules and rearing good birds and doing vet checks and not relying on antibiotics and doing worming programs and keeping good strains and overwintering but they're all doing it properly they feel they're being sort of undercut by the flyby knights who sort of get something from anywhere rear it any old town flog them for for whatever That's so know. true yeah it's so true like regulation or self-regulation or standards in any way can allow people to stand out from the crowd and and i've heard the same thing from keepers and shoot managers as well who were like doing everything by the book doing everything properly and, and are proud of what they're doing and they actually want a way of demonstrating that yes to, yeah. to others like a restaurant would with like super clean kitchens and all these awards and stuff you know they, they, it's yeah. the same sort of thing isn't it yeah yeah it is so i think i think there'll be there'll be something i mean people can the game farms association is great but it's all voluntary and not all game farms are in it mm. so i think i think there'll be something to do with that lead shot i think there will be a phase out there's a there's a poss- if the european we're signed up to the european's chemicals agency so although we post brexit we're still signed up to it. it's what something we're agreed on if europe say that lead shot should be banned and again i'm sure people write into your email there's every no study has ever said that there's a safe level of lead in your blood yeah. and it's and it's e- it's easy to say oh well my my grandfather lived to 103 and he had lead pipes and had pheasant for breakfast well that's that if well, good for your granddad you know well, well done him but if there's no safe level of lead and I yeah. think, and I think it's going to be com, uh, consumer led. Some of the supermarkets, although they're not our biggest buyers, are saying we we want non lead ammunition now. Okay, yeah. so the restaurants are saying, well, hang on, if if the supermarkets can have it, I want it. And then soon the butchers will say, well, hang on, hang on, if the rest, if the you know, if the supermarkets are doing it, and the, some of the countries abroad are doing it, and these restaurants are doing it, I want it as well. But there's absolutely nothing to to be scared to be scared of. I've shot non toxic shot as a wild fowler for for twenty years, and I've shot the most difficult duck and the highest geese with non lead ammunition. Absolutely no difference. And the reasons, you know, that the, oh we must keep lead, and and the, they're all trotted out. So steel shot will affect the milling process for timber. Will it? I don't know. Probably not. I don't, I don't yeah. shoot many birds at five foot off the ground. E- e- exactly. Tree. Will it affect it? I don't know. Let us, let us know. If the timber people say it will, that, well, let us know. There's a, there's a bit of a myth, that one. It, 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 it comes, comes from Scandinavia, doesn't it? But yeah. They actually ended up reversing that rule. And it was also based on rifles as well. Yeah. And I think they're all a bit of a myth. The other one, oh, I can't shoot my, my grandfather's purdy. Well, well, that's a shame. And I feel sorry for you, but you're in the minority. 
And if you can't shoot your grandfather's purdy, well, it probably needs rebarreling, and then you can shoot steel. Or you can buy a silver pigeon secondhand for £900 and shoot it for the next 30 years. So the gun thing, and standard steel loads will go through most most box locks anyway. Yeah, so I don't think that's a thing. If you've got a purdy, you can afford bismuth. Yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if you've got a purdy, you can shoot You can shoot steel. All the loads, they don't kill. I can't shoot a 70-yard pheasant with steel. Should you be shooting yeah. at a 70-yard pheasant? Yeah, exactly. You yeah. know, some, you know some, some, a, a, a very, very good shot, a very good shot, at, uh, I know, won't shoot at anything over 60 yards. He won't shoot at anything over 60 because he said, it's the golden pellet. One pellet, there's one pellet might kill that bird. He yeah. said, anything higher, it's, it's pure fluke and, and there's a risk of wounding. So, I think steel shots come in. I can't think the people who are on social media saying we're just going to, well, you know, we should stand up to this and we should fight for this. I haven't seen the bigger picture. They're, yeah, they're just I agree not. With you, there. you know, so, yeah. so steel shots, I think some sort of legislation, steel shot. And then finally, I think people are going to go back to appreciating shooting for what it is or what it should be. And people will start to buy days based on the experience and not the number you shoot and how much each one is going to cost you. That, that, yeah, that's, yeah. My fe- that's my fear. So, you know, a, a day out with us on so-and-so shoot for eight of you where you'll get some banging and kill some birds is going to cost you 400 quid each. It's going to cost you 800 quid each. That, that's it. That's the yeah. thing. We're not doing the by the bird. And we'll put on a day and it's an entertaining day and you'll enjoy it. And I think I think that that that's going to be half, half the pheasants and half the pheasants at twice the money almost. You're still getting your day. And if and I think when you get to a stage, or I do, if I if I've been on and I've been on some lovely, you know, bigger days, and no, I'm not going to turn them down if someone asks me. You know, so, so, <laughs> so I'm not I'm not going but sometimes if you've if you've shot twenty birds to your own gun, is it going to be a better day for shooting another five? You know? I, I'm completely on board with that. It it probably isn't. You know, yeah, I'm completely on board with it. So I think, I think, I think we'll see a see a shift. You know, yeah, yeah, and all for the better. I, I'm actually almost looking forward to some of that. Yeah. Well, actually, no, I am. I'm I am looking forward to a lot of that because it means it's going to be around for the long term. Yeah, and, I, I agree. and, and, and when you and when you talk about phasing out uh, lead to steel, you, when you're talking about the government stuff, that's from a legal point of view because obviously we're halfway through a sort of self regulated phase out. Yeah, the, the the voluntary transition. Yeah what you're saying and i think it looks like is probably going to happen is it's just going to be forced upon us anyway so it's actually really good that we're in this position of phasing out because we need to build up to it anyway because try you know moving from one year to the next completely 100 percent would be impossible hmm. Hmm. And, and the cartridge manufacturers and the gun trade are racing ahead and they're all doing and the first one to get there is going to make a killing excusing the pun yeah. but but they are it's like the um I know, the rubber tire versus the leather tire you know the rubber tire was best and the the rubber tire won so it's it's going to be it's going to be like that and there, and to those who said oh well i tried steel you know 20 years ago at some duck and it wasn't any good they have to realize oh it's so different it, it yeah. is so different and there are so many varieties and you if you have a favorite lead load you will get a you know you will find a favorite steel load you know pattern mm. it try it see what suits you you know what suits your gun as well yeah um, yeah I, I i've shot loads of different steel loads recently and i've really noticed that some just suit the gun more than others yeah they and, do and so and you just have to find the, the the amount that suits your gun as well and and i've got an old english gun which has been modernized to take to take steel and it doesn't suit really high birds you don't want to put a big load through it it's just not comfortable it's actually not enjoyable to shoot because it's too light Mm. so that gun kind of like a classic car has a place in my gun cabinet it's really great for partridge days Mm. uh there's some maybe not the you know the, the less high stuff but then you just need a heavier OU for a heavier load for a higher bird. And yeah, that's just the yeah. way that shooting's gone. It's just, we just got to accept that. It is. And, and if you want, if you want higher birds, you've got to move with it. I think people will come to appreciate the pheasant more because at the moment there's sort of a, oh, well, I shot it. It's a, it's a bit sort of, bit of willy waving really. You know, I shot a pheasant at 45 yards. Well, I shot one at 50 yards. Well, I shot, well, you know, I don't think you, there doesn't need to be some bragging rights on who, which shoot has the highest and who can shoot the highest. I think we're going a bit back to sort of Walshingham and De Grey and all those lot where we're trying to sort of outbrag each other. It should be a nice day. And there's a, there's a huge market for 
nice birds that challenge you, but you can kill enough of them. You can miss enough of them. You have a nice day that, you know, I, 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 we just need to adjust, you know, we do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Liam, I wanted to ask you on the gamekeeping front, we talked about sort of how shooting's changed and is potentially changing. Mm. Guns on Pegs is obviously a, a tech business, first and foremost. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, tech is more and more part of everyday life um, and lots and lots of jobs as well. It seems to me that beyond a bit of thermal imaging and the odd camera trap and that kind of thing, gamekeeping has been largely tech free do you can you see that changing in the next few years i can yeah i mean it's um i think the tech is useful i've got something i'm on something called the land up a plug for the land up guys and we map our field margins on it our stewardship options our woodlands our rivers we do all the mapping on it that's high tech which is far better than a, a pencil and a and a, a paper map sat on your knee so we use that as tech um, we have cameras, but we have remote cameras that email or text you so you can look at the pictures and see what or who's gone past. So that's useful. There are also developments on trapping. Uh, they're being yep. used on the states where they let you know when the trap's gone off. You still need to, you still need to check it in case the safety catch is on. There's grit underneath. There's something lodged underneath it. So it's not working. You still need to check things. Uh, but there's, there's that. Um, and just the general mechanization than tech i suppose but when we're talking about yeah. mule and sort of helping the back out and the lifting and yeah. but there's so there's so much recording and data recorded now and there are a couple of apps where you can record rare birds and you can mark your burns if you're on a moor and you can pay stuff out so tech is useful it's not to be all and end all and you couldn't be a gamekeeper if you couldn't work from home as it were and sit in your sit in your office and do it but it is improving it is helping and when you get your head around it it does save you a lot of time yeah so the robo keeper is a long way away which is good i think the robo <laughs> <laughs> i think the robo keeper is a long way off but <laughs> but what whatsapping betas groups and having group emails and uh, poach watch groups and bits and pieces. I think it all helps. And even a state, yeah. a state WhatsApp group, it, they all help as does the texting. And the mobile is super because you, you don't have to, you're always in contact with the people you work with. And when people come and work with me, I said, look, look, there are three numbers you can't ignore. You know, I said, there's mine. I said, there's the beekeeper, the other beekeeper and the, and the woodman, the forester. I said, don't ignore any of those. Anyone else, if you're busy, you can ring them back. I said, but don't ignore those because we may just be upside down, stuck underneath something, you know, or having a yeah. bit of bother, you know, not quite hanging off a cliff by our fingernails, but, but so that's good. And we've, we've all got an app uh, called What Three Words, which is quite a well-known one. Uh, yeah, very good one. We're, which is a very good one, which works from satellite. So you can sort of place something and that's useful for, uh, if you're culling deer, you can mark, you can mark. Uh, a, that's a, a good point. You can yeah. mark a beast that's down. You can you can zero it, press send send it on a text, and you can keep you know you can you can carry on going instead of having to ring up and say, well, go up the track where Bill made that dreadful beating noise with his really wild <laughs> with his really wild Springer Spaniel <laughs> on box on Boxing Day. Just go up there and and mark it. So we're using apps for that, and it's that's a very good safe a safety thing if someone breaks down and stuff like that. So, it? so it's a while till you get rid of the sort of lazy flank who doesn't want to blank in that that bit of extra cover with a drone instead. Yeah, it's, we're, we're, we're a little bit off that at the moment. You know. <laughs> it might be coming. i tell you the tech that I think would be absolutely fascinating, and I think it's currently impossible, but something that's akin to uh, sort of Hawkeye um, that they have in the cricket. In, in and, cricket. Yeah, yeah. Or, or the shot tracer that they have in golf that you can use on a drive so that you can then collect data about where the birds fly and the you know the height and the direction in different weather conditions and you can print out or you know you can you can produce like a proper kind of wagon wheel of the 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 of, of a drive so you can see where which guns are getting the shooting and all that kind of thing it would be so much fun it sli slightly takes the charm off it doesn't it yeah i, I yeah. think it's a <laughs> As a tool, I, wonder, I think it'd be very useful. <laughs> it would be to know which peg to draw, for sure. <laughs> we don't always draw pegs. Sometimes the guns are placed. But when we're drawing pegs, we're just going, look, we're shooting eight, you're up two. Everyone, and everyone goes, yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. But we did have s s someone involved with the shooter drew up a spreadsheet 
and he worked out that if if you drew number three to get the, you know then you wanted to move up to six for the second drive and then and then from number six you could go back to number two and he worked out this huge spreadsheet so that everyone get the same number of bangs over a day which, which was good uh, and we thought about it and I think we may have even tried it once and then the wind changed and we moved the order <laughs> of the drives and it, it totally threw and it didn't work I think there I think there are too many variables you know I'm sure people have tried it. Peg numbering has gone mental over the years. Yeah, yeah. There's there's something called the Durnford wheel we've mentioned before. If you Google the Durnford wheel, only one thing will appear in Google. Right. And it's and it's on our website, but that's quite good fun <laughs> for peg numbering. <laughs> so there's a lot of syndicates that are starting in and around now or the next few weeks. Uh, what advice could you give? Like one bit of advice, maybe one or two bits to a the the sort of DIY syndicate members who they don't have a keeper they all muck in and do their bit to improve their shoot what what what, what sort of thing would you say to them at this point don't shoot them too early but if they're not ready be brave enough to hold off be brave enough to say to the rest of the syndicate members because there'll only be a few who take an active part the others will be busy every saturday until it gets to october and then they'll suddenly be free every saturday don't be afraid if the birds you can only shoot them once hold off until they're ready and it'd be there'll be better birds there'll be bigger birds they'll eat better they'll fly stronger they'll be easier to corral instead of getting everyone's so keen to get stuck in and then they can get to christmas and then they lose interest because there's nothing left so go go steady early on and don't be afraid to hold off very good and, advice. Yeah, very good advice. That that would overcome that issue we had in the live podcast at the game fair, where yeah, every every season they don't have enough by the end of the season because everyone always has their big bag early doors, don't they? You just yeah, you yeah. almost want to have your smallest bag. I know that obviously it doesn't help returns as such, but you're talking about the quality for each day. Yeah, it depends. It depends how you tone the bag down, so you don't have to do every drive on every day. You know, yeah. you can do your smaller drives, and and we. We're quite proud of the fact that our the that we shoot as many birds on our last day as we do on our first day. Just by we'll do this drive, we'll do that drive, one drive in the afternoon only. You know, today we're doing three yeah. in the, three in this morning, having a good lunch. Just one this afternoon, chaps. You know, uh, uh, yeah, or or stop the drive early. Yeah, or, yeah. Well, we try not to stop the drive early because they do feel short changed unless you're really clever at it. They sort of. They sort of know the shouting gets less. <laughs> they, they really, well, on some shoots, not on our shoots, but they know the tap, the beetles sort of appear somewhere odd. But just just go steady and, and make it make it a day. And then after Christmas, when the cover's down and there are fewer birds and they're freer flushing, et cetera, and you've got time, you can do two drives in the afternoon and, and an extra one in the morning. And you can, there are ways of balancing it out, but I wouldn't go straight into all your big ones in October. Shoot everything when they're not at their best, when they're battling against leaves and all sorts of other stuff, and then run out after Christmas. It's it, it, it's not great. So is what you said there a bit of gamekeeping bragging rights, your, your last bag being as big as your first one? I don't know. Is that the sign of a quality keeper? <laughs> <laughs> it's a sign it's a, it's a sign of a of a boss who's happy or would prefer <laughs> prefer to shoot as many birds on a day in January as he does in November. Yeah, very yeah. true. So, yeah. so, so that that's a sad. And we can do it. Maybe you can't do it everywhere, or maybe if your letting days, if your letting days, well, obviously you you know your three hundred bird day can't have as many as your one hundred and fifty bird day. You know. Yeah. yeah. But in an ideal world, you, you'd eke them out. You know. Yeah. So, Liam, I've got one last question. It might be a bit of a big one for the last question, but for the last five years, you've been chairman of the representative body for gamekeepers. Gamekeepers tend to get a pretty hard time of things in the public sphere, not so much, obviously not in the shooting community, but you know, outside the shooting community. Do you think there's an argument for a bit of a rebrand in terms of how, what we call gamekeepers, whether we start calling them something like a wildlife ranger or conservation manager or something along those lines? I do, I do think there's mileage in it. Yeah, yeah. And we actually discussed this when I, when we had national committee meetings. And some of the, the guys and girls who are on the national committee are already called wildlife managers. Instead of being head gamekeeper, they're head of conservation. It's the conservation department. It's the wildlife department on the estate or the collection of farms. And I think it better reflects the job of the modern gamekeeper. Whereas... In, in before it used to be sort of 
um, shouting at old boys and shooting the vicar's cat and scaring people and being big and brash. It's not what goes on now. You yeah. Know? So I, th- I think there is a rebranding. And our detractors will say, ha-ha, they're trying to rebrand because. Well, that's fine. They can yeah. say that because they don't like us and they're going to, whatever we do, they're going to say something that they don't, you know, they're going to say something contrary. They are. But for the vast majority of people who don't know what a gamekeeper is, who have never met a gamekeeper, who have only read about a gamekeeper in a book, maybe, and then probably got the wrong impression of her. I think it, it better reflects and it's easier for, the, for the, 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 the public who, on the whole, are very ambivalent about game shooting. They're neither pro or against. Or, or against. You know, they, it, it doesn't really affect, they're not bothered. So it better reflects what we do. So I, I would be in favour of a name change. I would. I, th- I think it would, it would move us forward. I'm glad you say that. Yeah, I, I'm in total agreement. I, I had a text from John Queen at Linup. I'm not yeah. sure. I'm just holding you a picture. Up. Yeah, yeah. This is top the other day. Wildlife conservation on on his on his polo shirt that he's yeah, wearing yeah. around. Obviously, there's people there's there's people walking on the footpaths. Mm. They, they'll stop you. They'll chat. And yeah. And and actually, that is the role of a keeper. It is. That is what we're doing. Why? why we're almost uh, doing ourselves down by just calling it gamekeeping because that's simply not what's happening. Yeah, and 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 of course we will, you know, people have different opinions, and there will be people say, you know, started as a gamekeeper, finished as a gamekeeper. I will never ever change my name, and that's they're right. They don't have to. No one's telling anyone mm. to change their name. But I think it better reflects it. And if shooting changes or, or heads in the direction we discussed earlier. And people are then just buying days, buying the experience. Yeah. And we, we're we all showing this biodiversity net gain. And people start to appreciate the pheasant for the wonderful bird that it is and the partridge as well. And people see the benefits from the, um, controlling predation, reducing predation has on birds such as the curlew, which is very topical at the moment. Uh, and they see that the farmland bird counts on shoots are higher than all the neighbouring sort of farms or estates where there's no gamekeeper because the margins and the hedges are managed for shooting and because the, these feed crops are planted ostensibly for yeah. shooting, but the benefits associated with it. People will see this and it better reflects what we do. So I, I think I think we've, we've got to change, you know, we will. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah, but people can call themselves whatever they want, you know, but I, I think it'd be a good idea. Yeah. Well, the the way that we round these pods off is um, with with our one of our favourite segments, desert island shooting. So imagine you've got one last day. Oh, wow. Shooting's going to be shooting's going to be banned uh, the day after tomorrow. Yeah, uh, make it make it a weekend if you like. Where would it be? Who would you have with you? Time is no object. Money is no issue. What are you doing? Well, I'd like a bit of a time machine as well. Is that allowed? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've got one. My employer very kindly gave me a day's shooting when I'd done twenty years. When I've okay. been here for 20 years, which was a few years ago. I'm rather hoping he offers me one when I get to 30. because it's, it's, get, it's getting closer. And I invited my, my oldest and most longstanding and dearest friends to shoot with me. I'd like the time machine because yeah. whilst they're all with us, some now need a mule and a couple need new hips. And one's got, <laughs> one's got a bad back and, you know, they're not as fit as they were a few years ago. So I'd like the whole team sort of, I don't know, made 20 years younger. Or the the oldies made twenty years younger, and I would like us all to go on a big adventure, find a bothy and some good rough shooting with wild spaniels, steady labradors, whatever we wanted, <laughs> rabbit, snipe, woodcock, maybe a bit of a moor on the edge, plenty to shoot at, wild pheasants, and we would just have a blast, you know, and and that and that that's what I'd like to do. I would, I would. dreamy, really nice. Yeah, I, I, and then a big e- big evening in the Bothy after. A big evening in the Bothy. I mean, it would be a two-day affair. Okay. Well, yeah, we'd turn up on a Thursday night, and then we'd, we'd party gently, and then we'd yeah. we'd have a miles at a yomp, a proper march from sort of dawn till dusk tight yomp on the Friday. Big meal cooked by someone, as long as there's lots of it. Yeah. A few, a few glasses of things, and then another go, maybe slightly more formal on the Saturday. And then we could all sort of stuff ourselves with tea, tea cakes and crumpets and whatever we wanted about half past four and just collapse into chairs, you know? Yeah. Brilliant. Perfect. That's oh, yeah. Sounds amazing. Dreamy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> one day, one day. <laughs> yeah, it, it will happen. Yeah. Just yeah. got to plan it. <laughs> 
Yeah, right. Well, Liam, thank you ever so much. It's been huge fun. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking me. Really enjoyed it. Lovely. Right. So before we go, as per usual, there's a final reminder that you can get your hands on a pair of the highly exclusive Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock garters by sending us your shooting dilemmas or by sending us your unpopular opinions or nominating a shooting hero uh, or let us know where you've been listening or anything along those lines. Just drop us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com. Don't forget that we're recording our 50th episode live at Clay's Bar uh, in London on Friday the 4th of November. It'd be great to see you there. We will be back in a couple of weeks time with another episode and another special guest. But until then, thanks very much for listening and goodbye. Bye.